Uh, any golfers, any, any golfers, any attempted golfers in the sanctuary? Some of y'all are afraid to raise. So don't, don't be afraid. Just raise your hand if you play. How many play golf? Oh, yeah, got, got, got a few of those. Uh, you know, I, I was, I, if you know me, I, I love golf. And I, I took a four-month sabbatical from golf because I was playing horribly. Anybody ever had one of those moments? I just, I'm like, I'm tired of this. I'm just laying the clubs down. So I laid them down, and a few weeks ago, I started going back to the driving range hitting golf balls, and, and I was kind of shocked how good I was hitting, and I'm not playing for four months, and so I thought, after going to the driving range four times, John, I had to go play golf, and so I went out and just tested, because if you play golf, there's a big difference between hitting on the driving range where there's no trees or nothing, and actually playing where there's trees and houses and, and everything else, and I, so I went and played my first round in four months. And I shot a 79. Yeah. I, I was, uh, if you don't know, that's, that's all right. My best round ever is a 74. I'm not always shooting the 70s, but I was just shocked, not playing for four months. And I went out, and it, and it could have been lower. I, I, was, I had a par five. I hit a great drive, and I thought, man, I'm going to go for this in two. It's got a big pond and a rock wall in the front of it. And, man, I, I hit the ball good. I just didn't hit it quite good enough. It hit about 6 to 12 inches down on the rock wall into the water, had to drop, hit up, two putt for a bogey, so, but still pulled out a 79, so I was pretty ecstatic. So I just thought if you, if you, if you love golf and you have a, a good amount of free time, I don't always have that, I, I would love to join with you sometime. I can't guarantee how it always work out, but it's, I just enjoy the opportunity to get together with people and and, and, and hang out. If you have your Bibles, just a, a side story is all that it was. Uh, open up to the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter. The ninth chapter. Beginning a new series today that will lead us up to Resurrection Weekend that I've entitled Journey to Jerusalem. A Journey to Jerusalem. We, we recognize that Every year, thousands of people make their way to Israel, specifically to the holy city of Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, if you've been here a while, you know that there's a group of us that um, will be physically going to Jerusalem, uh, leaving out the end of April, uh, coming back the beginning of, of May, and be my second time to, to make it. I, I would just say this, if you've never physically been to Jerusalem, or Israel, I would encourage you to go. It's, a, it's an unbelievable, unbelievable trip. What many would say is a fulfillment of a, a lifetime, a spiritual lifetime journey, to be able to, to say, I, I physically have walked where Jesus has walked. I, I, I have physically been where, where Jesus has been. A, a journey to Jerusalem can, can be... a, a Obviously, a rewarding travel experience, but, but more than that, a very rewarding spiritual experience in our lives. And, and today, we're going to begin this spiritual, could we say it, journey to Jerusalem, walking with Jesus through some of these crucial hours surrounding his crucifixion, but also his resurrection. And as we journey this together over the next several weeks, I, I just encourage you to carefully to observe some of the different individuals along the journey and maybe see if you don't find yourself there. Find yourself somewhere in that story in regards to this journey to Jerusalem. Let's read this, Luke chapter 9. Pick up with me in the 18th verse. It says, Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, Who do you say I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God. Jesus strictly warned them, 
not to tell this to anyone. Verse 22, and then he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. And if you can, skip down several verses. I want to just read one more verse, verse 51. It says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. God, I pray that you'd help us to capture your truth. God, to walk in in your understanding, God, in these moments today. God, and I pray as always that we respond effectively to your word. God, believing that your will would be accomplished. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. If we were to take time to read all the way through the gospel of Luke this morning, and we're not going to do that, you would discover that in chapters 9 through 20, Luke mentions Jesus' movement toward Jerusalem several times. We, we just read this morning the first of many of these times that Luke makes reference to Jesus going to Jerusalem. We'll also find it in, in Luke, the 13th chapter, and the 17th chapter. You'd find it in the 18th chapter, and you'd also would find it in the 19th chapter. Luke uses this repetition to signal a decisive turn in Jesus' ministry. Look at it one more time. Luke Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. What, What I read a little bit earlier in this chapter is when Jesus was obviously beginning to prep his disciples for this journey to Jerusalem, but also what would be happening in Jerusalem. Much of this that they didn't understand, and actually one would begin to refute Jesus. In essence, how how could this happen, Lord? How could this be? Why? Because they really weren't understanding the fulfillment of the purposes of Jesus Christ. And through this this context of Scripture, I, I want us to capture three things this morning. Three things about this beginning journey to Jerusalem. Number one, recognize that on Jesus' part, this is, was what I would refer to as an act of courage. We know that Jerusalem was the center of Jewish life and religion. Just a little historical background here. And as such, it was the center of a growing animosity to this itinerant Nazarene being Jesus. Jesus' decision to set out for Jerusalem... I would say was a deliberate choice to enter into a storm. A very difficult experience in life. What, why would he do this? Well, we'll talk about it here in just a few moments. But understand, this demonstrated an immense amount of true courage On behalf of Jesus. On an earlier occasion, when Jesus announced his intention to go to Bethany to the home of Lazarus, you might remember the disciples warned him in John chapter 11. They said, Rabbi, the the Jews were but now seeking to stone you. And are, are you going there again? Jesus then replied, If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble. 
In essence, Jesus knew what he was facing. Jesus knew what he was about to walk into. Yet, yet with courage, we would, we would identify Jesus was willing to go. Jesus' journey to Jerusalem was not the irresponsible actions of a blind fanatic. He knew the risk, but he was willing to endure the risk because of courage within his life. Can I make this personal for us for just a moment this morning? Christian commitment does not shrink from going through the storms. What do I mean? This might be a different message than normal. I don't, I don't know, but sometimes we think when we accept Jesus as the Savior of our life, everything's going to be okay and wonderful. No. no. When we accept Jesus as the Savior of our life, we realize that all the forces of hell are against our life. To do what? To kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. We, 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 what, we, what we have now is assurance in the midst of the storm. We're, we're still going to walk through the storms. We're we're still going to walk through the difficulties of, of, of life, but we have the assurance that we're now not necessarily walking it by ourselves, but we're walking it, uh, most importantly, with, with Jesus and the comfort of his Holy Spirit within our lives, but prayerfully with, with other believers, with, with others who want to stand with us, those that want to journey with us to do what? To spur us on, to encourage us when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Because the reality, even though I've accepted Jesus, I I may walk through some of those valleys of life, but once again, I don't walk through them alone. And I, I, I believe that we can look to Jesus as that continuing example and inspiration for us to face life and all the difficulties of life with courage just as Jesus did. Hebrews 12 uh, reads, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, now this, this to me is one of those amazing scriptures we find in the Bible. Look, look at it one more time. It, it, it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. In, anybody in the room, when you know you're walking into a fire, when you, you know you're walking into the storm, how many of you have joy in your life? He says, but for the joy set before him, he went to Jerusalem. He journeyed to Jerusalem and endured. What was that joy that Jesus was experiencing? I believe it was the joy of knowing he was fulfilling the will of his father. Fulfilling the purpose of why he came to this earth. Knowing that it was going to be difficult. How, how did he do this? courage. But please don't lose sight this morning, church, that though we believe Jesus was God, yet he was fully man, had flesh and blood and bones like you and I, had feelings like you and I have, faced temptations like you and I face in life. It takes courage to walk into a storm. It takes courage, could we say it this way, to look at death and be okay with it. But that's what we find in Jesus in this particular moment. Secondly, this morning, as I've already alluded to, a commitment to God's will. Let's look at Jesus' commitment to God's will, doing doing the Father's will. The the journey to Jerusalem was part of Jesus' desire To do the Father's will. This wasn't the first time we find this in Jesus' life. You might remember early on, his his parents had made this journey, this pilgrimage, this spiritual pilgrimage, with a lot of the other Jews. And then it became time for them to begin to make their way home. And, 
and, and Jesus' parents set out, and then they realize that, hey, Jesus is not here. And they probably frantically begin to search around. It, it, anybody ever been shopping and you, you, you turn around and your child's missing? Anybody ever had one of those moments and, and you're frantically, you're looking around thinking, man, where, where did Kate go? Where, where did Kylie go? And, and you're searching through the store and, and you find them and, and they're like calm and at peace. And, and, and you're, you're shocked, you're worried, you're disappointed as a parent and now you find the child and all of a sudden that, all those emotions change to anger because you're like, why, why did you leave me? Anybody ever, am I the only ones that had those moments? And they look at you like, well, you knew I was always here. Jesus' parents, they're journeying back home, and they, they don't see Jesus, so they frantically start looking them, and where do they find Jesus but in the temple? And this is his remarks to them, beginning of this gospel, Luke. He says, did you not know that I must be in my father's house. And then we read what we're reading here this morning, and you could jump to the end of, close to the end of Jesus' earthly time here, and he's praying in the garden, anguish, knowing that he's gone from months down to days, literally to hours, in the garden praying, being tempted could we possibly say not to experience death? And in this moment of anguish, he cries out through prayer, Father, not my will be done, but your will be done. What, what, what am I painting for you today is a lifestyle of Jesus' commitment to his Father's will. From early on all the way to the end, we would recognize of his earthly experience. Dwight Moody once heard a preacher declare, the world had yet to see what God could do with a person completely dedicated to his will. And after hearing that, Mr. Moody determined to be such a person, and I believe the world has felt that impact, his commitment to the will of God in his life, although I think the statement was a little off because the world has already experienced what that's like in the life of Jesus. Once again, could I make this personal for us? What could be done through us if we had a similar commitment to God's will? That everything about us was about seeing God's will accomplished. If you've attended Cornerstone for any length of time, you've probably heard me say this. It's a big conviction in my life. There's not hardly a day that goes by that I don't wake up and before my feet hit the ground, I consciously Commit to Jesus, say to Jesus, Lord, might your will be done in my life today. God, I surrender to your will. Just trying to set my mind and to set my heart right before I even get out of bed. I, I can't stand before you and tell you I've been perfect to that. Because there are days that I've just got sidetracked by other things, other desires of life. Yet my, my, my prayer, my, my hopes is to, to live my life completely surrender to God, fo following distinctly the, the, the demonstration, the example of, of Jesus, that, that we would literally become a willing offering. 
Some, some view the will of God as a decision that's forced upon us, a, a decision that maybe was forced upon Jesus. I, I want you to realize that, that God did not coerce Jesus to lay down his life, that Jesus, through his own words, declares that he willfully laid down his life, knowing that that was the will of his Father. The content of his message, the nature of his person, made this, I believe, inevitable, inevitable for the life of Jesus, that that willingness to lay his life down, knowing, knowing what was going to happen, knowing the conflict, the storm that he was going to walk through. Okay, can, can I remind you that, that there's always a conflict between sin and holiness? It, it's just going to be there. When you surrender your life to Jesus, once again, Trust in his forgiveness, his salvation into your life, and then strive to live that righteous life. There's going to be a conflict with the world. It, it's, it's just going to happen. Jesus knew this, but was still resolute to go to Jerusalem to do what? To lay down his life. He said in John 10, I lay down my life that I might take it again. Listen to this. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. But he willfully became that offering. As we just remember this morning, through this beautiful time of of Holy Communion. Christ became our, our sin offering. He voluntarily offered himself for our sins to do what? To set us free. From sin and death being the consequences of sin. We, 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 we know this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. That's the consequence of sin. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Through, through his willingness to lay down his life. We can receive this eternal life. The, the writer of Hebrews explains it this way. Christ said in Hebrew 10, here I am. I have come to do your will. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We're cleansed. We're saved. If we will receive it because of Jesus' willingness to lay down his life. So we identify on this this journey to Jerusalem. It was an act of courage. It was a commitment to God's will. The last thing I want you to capture this morning, if we're willing to lose life, we'll find life. I have to lose my life in order to find it. It was Christ's offering as we've alluded to, that brought each one of us eternal life. Yet in order to possess that life, we must also be willing to offer our lives. In a few weeks, we recognize we'll celebrate the event that culminated Christ's journey to Jerusalem on Resurrection Sunday. But can I remind you? The crucifixion preceded the resurrection. There is no resurrection without the crucifixion. But why do I say this? The discovery of life comes in the loss of life. The discovery of life comes in the loss of life. Go, go back to Luke chapter 9 with me. Pick up with me in the 24th verse. It reads, then he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. We must do God's will 
And how do we do God's will? We, we must be willing to lay our life down, to give our, our lives away. Jesus said this in another way in Matthew 16. If any man would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Uh, when, we, when we read this this morning, church, I, I want you to capture this, this reality. It's not a, a one-time laying down my life. It's not a once a week laying down my life. The gospel of writer of Luke identifies this. It's a daily. That's why I have this, this conviction, this practice, that before I set my feet on the ground, I say, Lord, I surrender to you again today. I'm daily, daily laying down my life, picking up my cross, the cross, and following Jesus. Once again, there, there can be no life no real life without that courageous decision. That decision that says, hey, I'm going to crucify my flesh today. I'm going to lay down my life because it's in that moment that I really begin to discover the life that Jesus has purpose for me to discover and to live in. We're now in the midst of what is referred to as, as lit this 40 days preceding Easter. And I, I, I realize that, that Lent is one of those things that's observed by the Catholics, Episcopals, others. We often don't hear much reference to that uh, here at our church or in our, our sister churches. But what I would say is that the, these are the days of spiritual preparation the days of spiritual renewal, the days of spiritual dedication. And Lent corresponds to Christ's journey to Jerusalem. It was on his way to Jerusalem that Christ tried to lead the disciples into God's will and enable them to give of themselves, to be willing to, to lay down themselves. It's in these moments that the master teacher, Jesus himself, taught these crucial lessons about values and motives, about, about how life works. And it's in this that he teaches them this, what we just read, the, the importance of being willing to, to lay down our lives. You know, as we make this journey together, this spiritual journey to Jerusalem over the next several weeks, I wonder if there's something that we could lay down. I wonder if there's something we could give up as an act of devotion, an act of surrender, an act of courage and commitment to God's will within our lives. I, I, I know back in January we had a 21 days of prayer and fasting, but I, I don't think prayer and fasting and devotion, we ever stopped this journey, right? I, I wonder, I wonder what, what could I commit to surrender to Jesus in a demonstration of, of, of laying my life down, committing my, my life to Jesus. You see, I, I, I'm, I'm believing that, that this upcoming Resurrection Sunday might, might be the greatest Sunday in the history of Cornerstone Church. I'm, I'm already beginning to pray that we would see more people saved on this Resurrection Sunday than we've ever seen in the life of our church. That we would see more people healed, more, more people's lives restored. Why? Because we're trusting in Jesus. We're surrendering our lives to Jesus. And I just happen to believe that, that this is the plan and the will of Jesus in our lives lives and specifically into the life of our corporate church. I, I wonder how many of us maybe have friends or family members that don't, don't live for Jesus. That I would love to see them surrender to Jesus. I, I have them in my life. I, I wonder how many of us have friends or family members that, that just need a divine touch of Jesus into their life. And believing for the miraculous, I wonder, would we be willing to lay something down, to give something up, could we say, to fast unto the Lord, leading up to Resurrection Sunday? I, I shared this. I won't give the name. I thought it was interesting. I shared this in the first service also. And I had a gentleman walk up to me after service asking that I would pray with him. 
And he says, Pastor, that was amazing that you hit that because God called me to do this. And he goes, since I've done it, I felt like all hell has broken out against me. He said, but the flip side of it is I'm already seeing the blessings of God. He, he was sharing with me on his, his workplace that his whole level at his job was all laid off but him, and he was elevated to a higher position. And there's people that he works with that are struggling with everything that's going on, and one of these guys walked up to him, was sharing the difficulty of this experience, and the gentleman in our church said, can I pray with you? Can I pray with you? And the guy in his job says, well, I'm an atheist, but if you want to pray, let's pray. Just the blessings of God, the divine work. And he had the opportunity to pray with this gentleman right here in his workplace. And he says, I was just amazed when you began to present this to the church. He says, because I'm just believing that God's wanting to do some miraculous things. I believe God wants to do miraculous things in your life also. I, I believe God wants to do miraculous things in, in the life of our church. Leading up to, to Resurrection Sunday as we're talking about this, this journey to Jerusalem, I, I wonder this morning, church, would, would you be willing to, to join me, to join with me on, on this journey to, to know God's will but also the willingness to, to do God's will. I, I, I've said this many times. I've, I've spoken this over the life of my children day after day. I, before they would leave out and go to school, I would, I, I'd have times of devotion with them, times of praying with them. And I would literally lay my hands on both of my children, on Caden and on Kylie. And I, I, I would pray, God, give them the wisdom to know what is right. And as I prayed that, I, I said, I, I now bless you with the courage to do what is right. Because it's one thing, hear me, to know God's will. It's another thing to have the courage to do God's will. And as a father, I wanted my, my children to know, right, to know God's will, but also the courage to do God's will. To take that stand, knowing that they may be walking through a storm. They may walk into a storm. Yet we're still trusting in Jesus. We're still going to do what Jesus has purposed in position. I, I, I wonder, would you, would you join with me on this journey this morning, kicking off today, to know God's will and the willingness to, to do it? Will you make the commitment to, to follow him wherever he leads, even into the storm, even into the, 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 the difficult valleys of life? Could, I, could we set our face toward Jerusalem, remembering the words of him who has gone before us in Matthew 16? Whoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life shall find it. Shall find it. A willingness to be surrendered and committed to Jesus. And living with the courage that is necessary to fulfill the will of God. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning, church?